Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Uh, I wanted to make this episode about, um, I'm obviously going to have pharmacy news and talk about what's going on with the other blogs and podcasts and so forth, but I wanted to specifically talk about uh, Haley Ward's interview uh, on the Pharmacy Future Leaders with uh, Travis Hornsby of Student Loan Planner. And there was something he said that kind of made sense to me that I didn't really think about as I was kind of uh, going through it, and that's, are student loan numbers underreported? So the most recent numbers came out, and there was no move. And that was really weird, because tuition's gone up, and that would mean that we would expect the amount that you have to take out that would have to go up as well, but the number didn't go up. And what I'm wondering is, are students, when are students asked when they, when are students asked what they're reporting, and how do they go about knowing? Do they just say, oh yeah, it's like 180 Or is it like 160? Or do they go and actually look it up and say, okay, well, let me go look at my uh, numbers, add up all of my loans from all sources, and are they adding in maybe that they owe their parents 20 grand? Or are they including that their parents took out money? Because he had a story about how the parent had taken out $200,000, the child had taken out $200,000, and there was actually $400,000 in debt. So is it debt from all sources? And what I'm saying is that AACP is simply reporting what the students report, but I'm wondering if what the students report is what they actually owe. Because what we're seeing is that people are saying, I don't know who has that 160. I'm at two or I'm at three or whatever it is. So just something to think about as you're looking at your own student debt as you're graduating or you're trying to pay it off. Um, is it in line with what other people, you think other people are owing? So uh, what I wanted to really talk about also is that although Travis talks about how his company um, – is really for someone who has, probably for pharmacists, it's around 200,000 or more of student loan debt. And it's not that he doesn't care about the group that's under it. He's just uh, someone who you have to pay for uh, to get some advice, very specific advice. And he's found that the people that are most benefit from his uh, advice are those closer to two times what you make. So if you make 100,000, you should owe 200,000 or maybe one and a half times, a little bit more. And he said, there's not much we can do during pharmacy school. And what he's saying is his company doesn't necessarily do much during pharmacy school, but I know his company's working on a pre-pharmacy project as well. But YFP and then, you know, in the Pharmacy Podcast Network's Income Outcomes Show, they do talk a bit about what can be done during pharmacy school. So I just wanted to make clear that we have at least three resources in the podcast realm, Income Outcome Show, Pharmacy Podcast uh, um, Network, and then uh, Travis Hornsby, Student Loan Planner, uh, who deals generally with the higher end 200,000 plus, uh, and then YFP, uh, who has taken on during school, after school, uh, and so forth. So uh, three different places to go, uh, and I recommend actually going to all three. I want to tell you what I see on the pre-pharmacy side because it's a little disconcerting because I have a background in logic and um, when I say logic, I've taken formal logic. I've taken uh, classes in rhetoric. I've taken classes in that and I I know very well exactly what when somebody says something, what someone else is probably going to take from it. And I'll give you an example of an email that a student will get. So a student gets that the average salary – for pharmacists is over $120,000, and I'm not going to mention the school. But what they've done is they said 10 years out, that's what they're getting. So they've interviewed people that are 10 years into their careers and saying that's one hundred and twenty-two or 120000 or more that you're going to be making. 
Okay. But then they say 95% of our class secured jobs for education before they graduated. Well, let's look at that. So you either got a job or you got a residency. And right now it's about 25% of all graduates are getting residencies. So that's at 50000 and so maybe the job, we know what happened with Kroger, 32 hours, uh, and we're seeing 30 crew hour, 32 hours is now the standard. So really, you're looking at maybe 100000 for a uh, reasonable uh, higher on, maybe 90, maybe 100. And then you're talking about that f five out of 100 that didn't get a job from pharmacy at all and say, well, you know, they'll get some kind of job or something. Well, if you do the math, it brings... It quite it down quite a bit to have one quarter of your class making 50. But what I guess I want to say is that when you include two things in the same place, that's creating a misconception that the 120,000 or more is something that's going to happen to those 95%. And it's simply not true. Uh, as you're graduating, you're going to make, I don't know, if you're making residency, you're 50 is really good, and that doesn't change when you go into high-rent areas. So a uh, resident in San Francisco doesn't make 100000 where a resident in the Midwest makes 50 or 25 or something like that. The resident in the Midwest makes 50 the resident in California makes 50 but the resident in the Midwest is in much better shape in terms of cost of living and, and all those things. And I know I've lived on the coast and I've lived in the, in the Midwest. So I guess I'm a little disappointed that I'm seeing that the pharmacy schools are using truth, two true facts put together in such a way that the respondent will create a third incorrect deduction. And it's just a bit disappointing. The other disappointment to me is the white coat ceremony. I, I see it at every school. It's a tradition they go to the alumni to get the money from the alumni to sponsor the student. But what's disappointing is that the white coat ceremony is not about the student. The white coat ceremony is about making the student feel like they're a pharmacist. And it's about retention. You've worn the white coat, so you're going to stay in school. And that's always been kind of a little bit disappointing for me that uh, something that is, you know, could be very special is a way that they're actually taking money from the alumni to make sure that the students stay in school, uh, regardless if it's a good profession for them or not. Uh, Travis Hornsby mentioned that he's going to have a pre-pharmacy calculator or pre-pharmacy course or something like that to decide if pharmacy school is the right thing for you financially, if it makes sense. And he's going to be putting in some real numbers. He's not going to be putting in this, okay, well, you know, somebody who graduated in 2008, who was going to have a fraction of the loans that you guys have, then you now in 2018 is probably a pharmacy manager, maybe a director, uh, is going to have this salary. And no, he's going to talk about what the salary is when you graduate and 25% for residency. And then what are the numbers for those that made it out? And then also, we need to take into account the 11% that don't make it to the finish line at all. Now, are they leaving after first year where they have now picked up 40000 Are they leaving after second year? They've picked up 80000 and so forth. Because pharmacy credits don't really transfer to anything. Uh, they used to uh, back, when, back when I was in pharmacy school. Uh, we had completely different setup because what they did is they took some of the Ph.D. classes and maybe they kind of tweaked them a little bit. Uh, but they changed, they didn't change the name. So something that was chemistry was still chemistry. Something that was biochem was biochem. Something that was biology was biology. Uh, but now it's just this kind of weird PHRM or PHARM or PHAR or whatever it is. And those credits don't transfer. So I think that that's very, and, and I'm very hopeful for Travis's class, but I just know that it's, the the way that I see graduations and Facebook posts and the way that I know that I was and that many students are before they go in, the pride that you get with being able to put DR in front of your name is so strong to make your parents proud, to you know have that 
um, you know, at the end, at the end of pharmacy school, no one posts on Facebook. I am so excited that I passed the NAPLEX. Now I can help people. It's now you can call me doctor. And that's what they all say. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't say the same thing. That was a really big deal in first generation college. Uh, I didn't become a physician because that would have been a terrible choice for me. Uh, I, it's just not something I would have done. Pharmacy was a good choice for me. But also, I went to the University of Florida and I paid in-state tuition for two years at $1,500 a year. And then I went to Maryland where I had to pay a little bit higher tuition at around $2,500 a year. And then I went to pharmacy school where my tuition almost doubled at $4,000 a year. So my total tuition for all my years of college, and it took me seven years to do it, I, I think it's somewhere around, was it three plus three, six, we're talking about, um, I don't know, $22,000 in total tuition for seven years of college. You know, that's a semester for most of you. And my hiring wage was somewhere between 65 and 70, I think, but I only worked 32 hours. So my, my hiring wage, though, was, what, triple what I would paid for all seven years of college. And so when you put in a number like, hey, 10 years ago, uh, somebody started school and this is what they're making now, that's completely misleading. And they know exactly what they're doing. They could have picked from a number of different sources. The source they should have picked is the average person graduating from this school is going to make this much after they graduate because that's what people are looking for. So let me get off that stump and uh, talk a little bit more about um, the virtual pharmacy school fair. The first thing I never understood about this pharmacy school fair until I was reminded during that uh, pharmacy podcast episode is that the pharmacy school virtual fair is after the early decision deadline. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you want to make the virtual pharmacy fair after the very best applicants are available, have, have, are no longer available. They've already gone into early decision. And the only thing I can think of is that they're allowing early decision to happen because early decision is, and you can just look at their meeting that they had in, what was it, Boston, uh, that early decision is a way of getting people in and not having them compete for scholarships with other schools. And it allows schools to bring people in before they know what hit them. And this, the students are excited. In mid-October, there's going to be a bunch of Facebook posts. Hey, I got into pharmacy school. Well, that's not really special anymore. Everybody gets into pharmacy school. Uh, there's The number of applicants is now about the number of spaces. Uh, there's no. Uh, it's, it's just like the job market. Uh, right now, the job market, I believe has the number of employment opportunities exceeds the number of people to be employed. That Let me say it again. The number of jobs open exceeds the number of people to be employed. Now, that's not in pharmacy. That's in you know just the, the country. Now, some of those jobs are not good, and some of them are part-time, and some of them have no benefits. But I'm just telling you that if you want to get into pharmacy school, and if you apply to enough of them, it's really, really hard to get turned down. And it's just disappointing because as, as alumni, we're trying to advocate for the profession, and there are great things that are happening in the profession. But the favor that the profession is actually doing uh, for us is going to be, as you drive down the cost of employing a pharmacist, we're actually probably more likely to get provider status, I think. So if all of a sudden a physician says, wow, you know, it's going to cost me $100,000 to get a nurse practitioner on board or a physician assistant, but I can get a pharmacist in here for fifty grand. That makes a lot of sense. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, again, we're, we see that there's going to be another school coming into New York. They deferred it till next year. I thought it was over. Uh, and that school in Mississippi was the last one, but apparently there's another one coming in New York. And there is no justification for it. Like, there is none. Um, my alma mater, I saw, um, brought in almost as many students as they had before. Like, it just doesn't make sense. There are three schools of pharmacy in, in Maryland. You don't need 140 more uh, in Baltimore. And then add in 
um, Notre Dame, add in UMES. Now, Notre Dame serves a specific population. It's a women's college and undergrad, and UMES is a historically African-American college, and so these are all, and also serving a rural area. So I'm not saying there's not space for all three, but I just didn't understand why if Maryland shut down their Shady Grove campus, why they got pretty close to the 160 that they bring in each time. Maybe it's because attrition is at 11% and they know they're going to lose, I don't know, probably about 15 of those students. Uh, but again, kind of disappointed to see the pharmacy schools are still cranking them out, bringing them in. Uh, I guarantee PCAT scores and um, grades are not what they used to be. Um, seeing the big thing with the PCAT that, that really scared me was that the uh, competence in the English went down a full point. Um, and that means that there, that if our future is in communicating with patients, that we're doing the exact opposite of what we should be. What we should be doing is looking at organic chemistry, and we should be, if we need politicians that are going to advocate for us, we should be accepting political science majors who have taken chemistry and math but maybe haven't taken organic. We should be accepting business majors who have not taken organic. You know, every single school makes you take organic, and I get it. Organic is, a, is one of the markers of what would... Uh, make sure that you know you make it through your first year of pharmacy school but your first year of pharmacy school is actually the least like what you'll actually do in practice so i don't know if i if i was on admissions committee and i know there's schools that have they even just put you know holistic admissions uh, but their prereqs are still the same and i think that it's up to pharmacy schools to start teaching organic again uh, that really you should let in anybody that has an interest in science but has an excellent communications background. We should be bringing in communicators, uh, not the best organic chemistry students or the best chemistry students. Uh, it's not about chemistry anymore. Certainly there's a part of it, certainly with the medication experts, but I, I hate that expression because what we really need to be is the medication communication experts. It's our translation of what's going on to the patient, to the team, quickly, and that's going to keep it with them that really matters the most. Uh, so, speaking of prescriptions and those things, uh, I, I never checked a prescription in a hospital, which is kind of, uh, you know, I've been in this for 20 years, and I love TLDR's uh, new post, How to Verify Medication Orders Like a Pharmacist Boss, and not to spoil it, but uh, basically it was it was really... It's always fun to read, and what I loved about it was how in checking a pharmacist order, in, in retail for many times, it's like, does the color match the color, and all the other things have been done by the computer, and everything's, you know, that's the last thing you do, but he goes through this kind of, uh, oh, I don't know if he wrote this one, um, I think it's on TLDR, but I feel like someone... No, I think he did write it. I don't know. He didn't. I thought he. I thought I saw at the bottom that there was uh, some author. Let me get it right. Uh, I can't. I see another name down there, but uh, not sure if she wrote it. He wrote it. Anyway, uh, I just let me just take you through it. So he says, okay, so you're your hospital pharmacist your first day, and you get a ceftriaxone order stat. And so you look at it and you say, okay, well, it's verified, it took 20 seconds, right? And then he says, okay, well, now you've got to start thinking, is it an 18-year-old or a 90-year-old? Uh, are they 45 kilos or 145 kilos? Um, <clears throat> are there medication allergies? Has it been updated? Are there any penicillin cephalosporin allergies, shortness of breath, things like that? And then um, is there an HMP in the computer yet? Why not? Uh, let's look at the microbiology orders, and it just goes on and on. It's so cool. It's just kind of this rapid fire, like, well, did you think about this? Did you think about this? Did you think about this? And I think it's so cool that, you know, you, you have that uh, you have that kind of stream of all the things that a pharmacist does bringing in the order together. And 
uh, I, I just think it's a great read. So definitely check out TLDR, TLDR's Pharmacies, uh, How to Verify Medication Orders Like a Pharmacist Boss. Uh, it's not what you think. If you think it's like, okay, Prilosec is purple, the pill in front of me is purple, I will check it and verify it and move on. Uh, it's completely different. It's, it's uh, really cool. Uh, I hope you, you're able to listen to uh, Eric Christensen's or TL, um, Ed Ed 101's um, podcast, reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, he just did an episode on Carbidopa Levodopa September 6th, and he's been pretty consistent every week, uh, getting a 7 to 15 minute uh, podcast episode out about uh, pharmacology and uh, something that you can keep up with your practice, uh, especially if you're in long term care. Uh, maybe you're thinking CGP. Uh, that's definitely, definitely a thing you want to uh, look at. Uh, Happy Farm D. Uh, this is really important to kind of look at the hiring side because as an applicant, you may not think, okay, well, uh, I just want to make sure that I have all the check boxes uh, that this person would need. And well, what are those check boxes? What does a successful applicant look for? We know the market stuff. Uh, so uh, I think it's a pretty good uh, blog post understanding from the hirer, hirer, hiring person uh, what it's like. Uh, pharmacotherapy, again, if you haven't checked it out, the audiobook on Amazon.com or Audible.com. You can usually get it free if you've never been uh, on before. Uh, definitely check it out. Uh, case studies uh, that Eric Christensen put together. I produced it with uh, narrator Mike Lentz, who's also a pharmacist. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, YFP, they just had uh, started, I think, a with Nate Hendrick, who's the real estate RPH or something like that, uh, sex, six, <laughs> sex, oh God, uh, six steps to home buying, uh, part one. And uh, home buying is something that you do emotionally and justify logically. And so the more logic you can get in before you start home buying, the better off you're going to be. Uh, I can tell you what I'm seeing right now is that it's becoming a soft market. Uh, what's happening is is that as interest rates rise, it becomes less affordable. And rents right now, because the prices have gone so high uh, with the homes, uh, rents are becoming uh, – rents aren't getting lower, but uh, it's maybe better to rent sometimes than it is to buy. There was an article in the YFP community about that. And for me and – you know, having a family, it absolutely makes no sense to rent and to worry that, oh my gosh, this uh, person might come in and and who knows what's going to happen if, you know, next year are we going to be able to you know, renew our lease? You know, no, this is our home. We're going to be here. Uh, we can pay off our mortgage if we absolutely have to. If we dipped into all of our savings and all of our 401k, you know, we could uh, pay off the mortgage if we had to. Uh, but Definitely check out the latest from YFP, uh, The Six Steps to Home Buying. Nate Hendrick uh, is a really neat guy. Uh, I think they're all out of Ohio. Uh, RX Radio, I haven't seen anything since the Should You Change Careers uh, episode. Um, he does a really great job of talking through the pros and cons of remaining a pharmacist. And, and if security is something that you want, uh, then the pharmacy career is not really... I don't know if really any career is necessarily safe, but having only a pharmacy career is maybe not the best way to go. But he's also talking about some of the things that he does outside of his normal pharmacy career uh, that I think are really interesting. Uh, talk to your pharmacist podcast, uh, pharm the pharmacy advisory group, Hillary Blackburn. She just uh, had the pharmacogenomics and health coaching, uh, which is, I think, a, a good way that many of us uh, could find something else uh, to do. And then... Uh, she has the, first, uh, the versatility of a PharmD uh, with a new student pharmacist, uh, Shanice Anderson, uh, who went to Howard University College of Pharmacy. That's TLDR Pharmacy's uh, Brandon Dyson's alma mater as well. Uh, and I would check that out. So I uh, always like listening to the pharmacy advisory group, Hillary Blackburn. She's always got great stuff to bring along. Uh, Brian Fung, uh, recently he had a perspective from the residency program director and it was well, Although it was within informatics and it was PGY2, I think it's always valuable to see the other side, just like you're thinking about hiring manager, think what the residency program director is thinking. How do they think and what are they looking for? And it's not as much like, okay, well, I can say the right things. It's, oh, 
all right, now I get how I should present what I do. And that's really what it is. It's, it's really just a rhetorical situation. You're just trying to make sure that you present yourself in the best light possible, and maybe that does or doesn't match uh, what they want. But always valuable to hear from an RPD. Uh, Kevin Yi had, uh, <laughs> well, he, he had How to Quit Your Pharmacy Career last uh, week, and, was, and then he went to the dark side of entrepreneurship. Then he went to Starbucks Reserve. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I just had, I don't know, pumpkin spices out, so I've just been drinking that. I'm not going to try anything uh, outside of that for a while. And then Paul Tran, uh, I didn't see anything on his pharmacist blog. I didn't see uh, necessarily if he had anything on DIY Paul Tran, uh, anything recent. I know he takes a lot of time to make those uh, videos, but no, nothing since a month ago on that one. So uh, hoping that he's still getting that uh, Home Depot partnership together. So uh, sorry I got a little bit on the stump there at the beginning of the episode, but uh, definitely I you know reach out to... Uh, these groups, whether it's Travis Hornsby from the Financial Planner, if your loans are going to be around 200000 or more, uh, definitely reach out to the YFP community. If you're uh, someone who's you know, going to be taking loans of any kind, uh, I think they're fantastic in terms of really having three, two pharmacists and a military academy graduate who is the financial uh, planner. Uh, really a great team uh, coming together. And, and that's what drives me crazy about residency is that now it's like all for one. Nope, it's one for one, uh, where you kind of divide, where I think it would almost be better if we had residency team uh, places where a team that's come together in pharmacy school or that wants to come together after pharmacy school can do something as a group. And then, of course, uh, Income Outcomes Show as well uh, provides some great advice. So if you have any questions for me, uh, you got my email, A-A-G-U-E-R-R-A at dmac.edu. And uh, I'm always happy to you know, try to give you my thoughts on something. I just recently had a PA student ask me about uh, you know, what can I do to get my chances in. And, and the reality is, is that you may not be able to get your chances in to get into PA school because uh, the competition is actually it's harder to get into PA school than med school. Or somebody from med school asked me, how can I improve my pharmacology? Uh, I have a learning disorder. You know, what are some things that I can do? And, you know, some of the things that I've put out in terms of pronunciation, breaking the words down, etymology uh, can help them. So I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you have. Um, And, uh, you know, really, I I want my profession to do well. But uh, right now we're in in a bit of a bad spot. And um, until we see, I hate to say truth, but until we see... Uh, the admission that, hey, we have way too many schools and we have way too many graduates. Uh, You're not supposed to have to be innovative, so innovative with your degree that you should have gotten another one, that you don't need it. Right now, we're just doing the same thing law schools did in 2008, 2009. And, and, uh, you know, we're going to go through a bumpy time. And I want to be here to support those of you that do want to be in the profession, that that want to do the best they can. Uh, I got out of retail, you know, almost a decade ago, and uh, I haven't really looked back. But I want to help you uh, if you you need it. So I'll talk to you next week. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag hashpharmacyleaders. 